0609. The message to the Laodicean church. Thank you very much. Audience applause. Thank you kindly. It's a privilege to be here in Dallas tonight. I certainly look forward with great anticipations of getting back to this state of Texas again. And some time ago, when I was in Waterloo, I had come in contact with Brother Lindsay that invited me down to this Voice of Healing Convention. Later in Chattanooga, I met our dear friend, Brother David Duplessis, that also inspired me to come and to come and have a part in this convention just to see if there's a group of people and so forth that it would be very fine of them to ask me to be their next speaker these six nights. I missed every one of them by not knowing just. It was to be in the afternoon, and I'm sorry of that because I got in the city too late to even get here for the afternoon speaking, but it's certainly a privilege to be here tonight and to be associated with the Voice of Healing Convention. And we're trusting that God will give us the ex exceedingly I want to say above all that we can, hearing Brother Vineyard just now, as we drove up, going over into the Finland, I believe that's wonderful, and we believe that our Lord is coming soon, and we are now just gathering up, gleaning from the field, the part that's been left, like Ruth in the field, up, I suppose, gathering up that which is savable, and God has ordained eternal life. We are trying to gather that up, and I'm so glad know that we live in one of the greatest days that man has ever lived in, just before the coming of the king. This is my third visit to Dallas, I believe, once was with a minister, I forget just, I think his name was Brother Goff. He had a little church out here, I believe, over in Dallas proper, and then I come one time to start to some uh, stadium or something, here, or some, I forget what the name of the place was, uh, man speaks about the Branham Fair Park. That's exactly right, sir. And then this, I think, is uh, the, our third time. And we're happy to be here tonight and to minister on till Friday night, the Lord willing. But it certainly does make me feel rather out of place or a small, little small as just an old, what would I call in the South, a suffrage preacher. How many know what a suffrage is? My, what part of Kentucky are you from? So here, where... And up here to speak before these fine ministers to be an evening speaker, it certainly makes me feel good. And to think that many of these men here are in the field preaching when I was a sinner boy around horse races, so or around the boxing ring somewhere, and to know that they made the way clear so that I could run over a smooth road. So I'm grateful for my brethren tonight, and I trust that what little effort that they can put forth that will be a blessing to all to make the sinner realize. That he is a sinner and to make the saints rejoice in Christ, to make the sick know that there is a healer, and to my brethren to be inspired just to move forward with greater anticipations than ever before. Now, because I know that I never have yet, I was ordained in the miss Missionary Baptist Church, and after the Missionary Baptist Church, I have never taken up any affiliation with any church since. since. I started denominations because I try to stand right in the bridge between all them, them all and say we're brethren. I believe that's right, that we are brethren. And so therefore I don't represent any certain denomination or church, but I represent the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where all of you belong in that great body of Christ. And we're looking for that day to come when we will rapture his church to go home. And the Lord willing, this week, I want to speak on some of that. And on the typos of the church going, the handwriting on the wall, and united under God, and a few things of that type, the Lord willing, in this coming week. And I believe that this is the very foundation, the Bible. I believe that God does many things that's not in the Bible. He can do anything because it's God. But I think that doctrine should come out of the scripture. That's God's book to us. Now, in the Old Testament, there are two or three ways of knowing whether it is truth or not. That is, they would go to what they call the Urim Thummim. And that was, I've been told that, was the breastplate that Aaron had, that had the twelve stones in it. And then, when the prophet prophesied or Adema told his dream, and did it not, a conglomeration of lights flicker on this Urim Thummim, then the prophet was wrong. See, God always had a way of answering in supernatural, see? Always the truth is known. So if that 
would not clash, and then the man and the prophet was wrong. And now, after that priesthood was done away with, and we have a new priesthood, tonight Jesus Christ being the first priest, we have a Yerim Mesamim, and that's the Bible. Take away your add to, the sin shall be taken from the book of life. So we'll try our best by God's help to stay right in these pages. I've often said this. I just want any less than God has in the Bible, and but I want all that He is in the Bible. Just all the promises that's to us. So before we begin the word for our text, let us bow our heads just a moment in prayer. Eternal blessed God, this is such a grand privilege tonight that we have of standing in the divine presence under this great tent where your children are assembled together for no other purpose but to hear the word and to see the moving of the Holy God. And we would ask tonight that you would pour out your blessings upon in a great way, change our thinking, ways of thinking. If they're wrong, Lord, and set our thinking on the Son, the Lord Jesus, may our hearts be filled with His presence. When we leave tonight from the meeting, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as He talked to us along the road? And now, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will just take these few words and thus be read and will pour out the context of them in every heart. Grant it, Lord, help me, Father, as I'm standing here, that my soul may rejoice in your blessed presence. For you ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, to begin my part of this convention of the speaking, I have chosen a little text found over in the book of Revelations. To you who mark it in Revelations, the third chapter and the twentieth verse, I wish to read this portion of the word. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This text of Revelations here is a message to the Laodicean church, which I truly believe that not being a dispensationalist exactly, but yet I believe that we are at the end of the gentle dispensation that was spoken of, and I believe that the Laodicean church age was the last church age, and I think that's where we are tonight, and that's why I've taken this for a text. And some might say, why Brother Branham isn't this a small text for a group of people of this size and for a convention of this caliber? If you just read just a few words in one little verse of scripture, but you see, it isn't the size of the scripture, it isn't the size of the reading, it's what it is count that counts. Some time ago in Louisville, Kentucky, a little friend of mine was up in the attic, an old garret in the house, and he was fumbling around the little lad, and he stumbled into an old trunk, and in this trunk he found out an old postage stamp, just about one half inch square. And he thought maybe with this on his mind that he would, uh, ice cream might come from his stamp. So he hurried down to the street to his friend that collected the old stamp and said to his friend, I found this little old yellow stamp. It's quite old. But I just wonder if this stamp is worth anything. And the stamp collector got his glass out and looked over it a little. And he said, I'll give you one dollar bill for the certain stamp. And of course, the little lad, not expecting more than five cents, the sale was made quickly, and that dollar meant many ice cream scones. So after a while, he was about two weeks later, this collector sold this certain stamp for $2,500. And about six months later, he sold it for about $500,000. And see, it wasn't a little stamp, it's a little piece of paper. It's what was wrote on that piece of paper that counted. That's the way it is with my text tonight. It isn't the paper that it's wrote on. It isn't the size of the text, but it's what's wrote on it. It's the word of the living God. It's, it's so essential till all the heavens and earth will pass away, but it shall never pass away. See, God notices every little word that we read. God knows every little thought that goes through our mind, every little act that we do. And I'm currently thinking this, that many times the church in its looseness gets to do things and thinking things and taking things just as they are when we ought to weigh what we do and say. We ought to think it over before we speak it. My old southern mummy used to tell me, think twice and speak once. It's the little things sometimes that we live and done that means so much to us. We get in such a hurry to race over things in this neurotic age that we live in. It would behoove us as a church of God tonight to stop and wait a minute, see where we are at. Some time ago, I was standing in Vancouver, British Columbia, 
and the King George of England had come over to visit Canada and he was making his way down the street in his beautiful carriage and with his queen sitting by him and Mr. Baxter, one of my associates, he was with him because he had just think by the Branham of King passing by and I thought if that would make a Canadian weep because King George, the Honorable King, was passing by, what will it be when Jesus passes by? He's the King of Kings and a beautiful bride by the church. And now all the schools turned out and the teachers give the little children a, a little British flag to wave their loyalty to the King as he passed by. And as the King had went by, there were certain schools, there was a little girl that did not return to her place. And the teacher, being alarmed, she rushed out in the street to find what had become of the child. And as she looked along the street, she found the little girl standing by a telegraph pole, just weeping her little heart out. So the teacher goes over to the little girl and she said, Darling, why are you weeping? So said, Why did you not be able to wave your flag at the king? She said, Yes, I waved my flag at the king, teacher. Well said, Did you not get to uh, be able to holler, hail to the king? Said, I, I hollered, hail to the king, teacher. Well said, did you not see the king? She said, I saw the king, teacher. Said, well then, why are you weeping for, darling? She said, teacher, you see, I saw the king. But I'm so little, the king didn't see me. But how different it is with Jesus. You don't have to be in who's who. You don't have to be, to have your name on some great book of some sort. No matter who you are, Jesus sees you. And he knows every little act that you do. Every little thing that you do for him, every little thing that you make, he keeps it on his book. He knows all of us, whether we be important in this world or not important. We're all important to his kingdom, whether we are rich, poor, or indifferent. You see, this also is a pardon to small groups. I've read in our scripture tonight that we would close up every boat like joint in Dallas, and that will put every church that's on one another's throat, put them on right back to the old-fashioned fellowship and a revival, it will do it. Some time ago in the day of our most memorable Abraham Lincoln, it was told that there was a prisoner in the camp that was sentenced to death by a federal crime that he had done. And some good man went and asked the president, won't you pardon a certain man? And the president Lincoln, as we all know, to be a Christian, the man said, sir, you know the man's got a mortal soul or an immortal soul that you are going to take from his body. And will you take his life and him begging for mercy, Mr. Lincoln, fixing to get into his carriage, just wrote a little piece and said, I pardon this man, Abraham Lincoln. And the man rushed back quickly to the prison cell and said, Sir, I have your pardon. So the president had then to speak. And the man looked at him and said, Oh, if that was a real pardon, it would be on a great paper with a seal, and it would have all kinds of gold letters in it if it come from the president. And he said, Why do you make fun of me? And knowing that I am to be shot in the morning at sunrise. He said, I'm not making fun of you, sir. This has got Abraham Lincoln's signature on it. Oh, he said, this is just enough for me to believe it. And he refused to receive it, and he was shot the next morning, and there is a pardon at large wrote by Abraham Lincoln that this certain man was to be pardoned on this day, and a firing squad killed him the next day. It was tried in federal court, and here was a decision, a pardon is not a pardon, except it be received as a pardon. And this was God's word that I've just read. It's a pardon to those who want to accept it as a pardon, and it's healing to those that want to accept it as a healing. And it could be any great blessing that God has promised if we will believe it and accept it as such. See, no matter what size it is, what kind of a book it's wrote on, as long as it's God's eternal word, this is a very strange thing to see a man knocking on a door to be in the scriptures, I just forget the artist or the name who painted the famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. I can't call his name, he's a Grecian artist, I believe. And when all great pictures, before they can be hung in the Hall of Fame, they have to go through the Hall of Critics first. And then it just reminds me of the church. Before the church can ever be taken to glory, it has to go through this Hall of Criticism. And sometimes you try to shut, pull back. From criticism, well, that's only testing. It's golden nuggets to you. It's something that God has permitted to you to try you and to bring you through 100% pure gold that's shining. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Says the scripture. So the criticism 
We welcome that because that's what we have to put us through the fiery trials. So these artists when the fisher was going through the hall of critics, there was one critic said, Sir, I think your portrait of Christ is beautiful. And I think standing at the door and the fine anticipations of watching and waiting that someone would open, but he said there's one thing wrong. That is that you haven't got any light for him to go in at. And the artist said, oh, I felt it is lost. You see, in case the latch is on the inside, you must do the opening. Christ does the knocking. And that's the way it is with every person here tonight that's seeking God for anything. He's knocking at the door, but you have to open it up. You are the one that's under control. You're on the inside. So open the door. If you need salvation, if you knock, receive it. Open the door. If you need healing, open the door. That's all you have to do, and then he will come in. Then, if you'll notice, a man knocking at the door is trying to gain entrance. And surely no man would knock at any man's door unless he had something important or something that he thought was important to talk over with the man. And that great men have knocked at doors down through the ages. For instance, back in the days of Rome, what would happen if the great Caesar, Augustus Caesar, would have went down to a peasant's house and would have knocked at the door, and this peasant would have come to the door, he would have seen who that great emperor was. He would have fell prostrate on his face and said, Great man, great Augustus Caesar, come into my house. What an honor it would have been for a poor man, a peasant, to have the emperor of Rome standing at his door. That would be being a great honor. Or in the days of the late Adolf Hitler, what if Adolf Hitler would have went down to a peasant's door or a German footman at all? soldier's door and would have knocked at his door and when the soldier opened the door and saw the great fury of Germany at that door standing at his door he would have come to attention and would have shout, saluted and said oh Hitler come into my house anything that's in this house that you want is yours why Hitler was an important man in his day especially to a German in the days that he was a di dictator of Germany oh I might say this what if a great president right Eisenhower would come to Dallas tonight and he would have come to the house of the best Democrat there is in Dallas. It would have been a great honor to you, sure. You might have disagreed with him on politics, but Dwight Eisenhower is the president of the United States. He's a great man. It's the importance of the person at the door that's knocking at town, certainly. And though if he come and knocked at your door and you disagree with him, you wouldn't have said, well, wait a minute, Mr. Eisenhower. You just go away from my door. I'm a Democrat. No, sir. You would invite him in, and uh, what would happen tomorrow? Why do it? Eisenhower would have humbled himself, I believe, to him to be a great president, and he would have humbled himself to come to your door. Just an ordinary man. Why? The television would pack it. All around the world tomorrow would know that Dwight Eisenhower come to some poor man's door in Dallas, Texas, how he humbled himself to do so. Or what if the queen that just visit here, she went up into Canada, the Queen of England. She come from down in the United States. What if she would have come to one of your doors, you women here? Maybe you would have looked at her and said, I don't understand who you are. And she said, I'm the Queen of England. Though you're not her, but yet you would have been honored to have the Queen of England at your door. Any person would, because she's an important woman. She's the greatest queen on the earth, over the greatest. That's the greatest known queen in the earth is the queen of England. Why? You would have said, come in, queen, and look over my house. And if there's anything here that you desire, you may have it. And if there had been a little trinket sitting on the shelf that your grandmother would have held back giving you, and if she'd have asked for it, you'd have let her have it because of her importance. She's a great woman. It would have been an honor to surrender this little treasure to the Queen of England, certainly, because of her importance. But, oh, brother, sister, here is what I'm here to say. Who is more important to knock at your door than Jesus? And who's any more turned away than Jesus? He turned away more than all the presidents, dictators, the kings in all the world ever turned away. Jesus has been turned away. The queen, the dictator, might have been bring something to or taking something from you, but Jesus coming to your door wants to give you something, the best thing that you would ever receive, eternal life, turned from the door, 
oh, it is a tragic thing if a man or woman would only stop and think for just a moment that the king of the Lord, the king of life, the son of the living, eternal God, is knocking on a mortal's heart to give him something good and he sends him away. Every divine promise in the Bible is yours tonight. If the faith of God knocks at your heart, then you can have it. Why would we worry? Why would we try to say, well, I'm just afraid it won't happen. How can we ever comprehend that in our mind when the King of Glory promised it? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear me and will open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. Now, sup here means to commune or fellowship. Jesus wants fellowship. That's what God's heart longs for tonight. He longs for it in Dallas and in every place in the world. A breaking down of prejudice, a cleaning up from the pulpit all the way down to the basement, and an old fashioned revival that will shake the nations together and will fill the little church of the living God, shake hands with the holiness, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, the Nazarene. He longs to get in to a fellowship in his people, come in to commune with you and to bring you something good. While the church and the people keep him away to coming down because they say, well, that group don't believe just like I do. What difference does that make? That has nothing to do with it. We are Christians, born again in the same family. A bunch of pilgrims will never see eye to eye until we see him face to face and be changed and made like unto his own glorious body. We need a breaking down, a cleaning up, a house cleaning, and a real revival to start when the gifts and powers and manifestations of the Holy Spirit can come into the church showing great signs and wonders. How can God do it upon a divided group? He can't do it. God loves his people. And we must all come together at the great mass meetings and forget being Baptists and Presbyterians and so forth. So he knocks at the door of every mortal. That's his duty. That his, that's what he's here for. No one gets passed by. All of them is invited, the crippled, lame, halt, blind, usurped, Dallas tonight, and every church here, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, and the rain, pilgrim holiness, oneness, oneness, threeness, all you are, and drag down those little differences and come together. They'll empty the hospitals around here, and it will cause something to take place that headlines will come into the paper, television, will discuss it across the world when Jesus Christ comes into the world of homes. It would do it, friends. That's what these meetings are for. That. That's the idea of these ministers sitting on the platform here. That's my purpose of being here, is to try to tell you that Christ loves his people and we must get together for the moving of the Holy Spirit and the rapture of the church. God willing, this week, I'll get to it. Now, you see, Mr. Branham, I just want you to know that I have left Jesus in a long time ago. Well, to that, I'm thankful if you let him in. But now, there's a whole lot more than just letting him in and letting him have his way after he gets in. If he, if you ask me to your house and I knock at the door and I believe that you love me well enough to say, come Brother Branham, and shake my hand and say, welcome. Well, if you told me I was welcome, there's enough Kentucky in me to believe that I'd be welcome to anything in the house. I'd go and take my shoes off, stretch out across the bed and rest. If I got hungry, go to the icebox. Make me a sandwich, sure. I'd feel welcome if you told me I was welcome. But when you let Jesus in, the people take a different attitude. You say, Jesus, I don't want you to let me, I don't want you to let me go to hell now. Well, I'll let you in that door, but you can stay there at that door. Now, you know, in the human heart, after he comes in the first door, there's a whole lot of other doors all around. Let's talk a few of those, not to hurt your feelings. But let's just talk about them a few minutes. The first door that you have a right when you get inside now, that's the door of private life. And I say, Jesus, you can come in and save me from hell, but don't you go to the meddling of my private life. If you do, I just can't go any further with, with you. That's the reason we never get nowhere. You are willing to accept some form of baptism and some rituals of the church, but when Christ comes to you and comes in and tells you to put away sin away, that's when they come. And now you can't play cards no more. You can't go home on every morning when prayer meeting is on and listen to Uncle Godfrey. That rascal or every stressful rock and roll in the house. Set yourself in the backyard and get a suntan. You deacons and church members smoking cigarettes and things 
No wonder you, no wonder Christ can't have the right of way in the heart. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but what happened to the motto of this Pentecostal church? It used to be wrong for you to cut your hair. I remember that. And now you say, preacher, there you go. You're hitting that. All right. You see where your private life is. The Bible is against it. If the Bible said in grandmother's days it was wrong, it's the same Bible tonight. The Bible says if a woman cuts her hair, her husband can divorce her. She dishonors her head. Oh, that's right. That's what the scripture says. Now, there's something wrong somewhere. Either in the pulpit, in the pew, in the pulpit, one. That's right. Now, that's true. But now notice it used to be wrong for you ladies even to wear skirt low and to the front and up like that. But now, they the Pentecostal women went short. Now, that's right. What do you say? Do it for? Well, you see, I won't wear them. I wear slacks. That's worse. You know, the Bible said that a woman that will put on a garment that pertains to a man is an abomination in the sight of God. Why can't we have a great healing service and a great revival? Stand up for it. The sin at the door, that's where it's at. You say, well, I belong to the this and I, that don't have nothing to do with it. It's Christ through his word, knocking at the heart is true. Some of these little old duchies looking clothes that women wear, well, you see it to me, Brother Branham, that's the only kind that they sell, but they still sell sewing machines and goods. It suits you. Now let me ask you something, sisters. Do you know what you're going to be guilty of at the day of the judgment? For commission of adultery is sinner. The Bible said, Jesus, a blessed Lord, said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already. And if you present yourself like that, you may be as pure as a lady to your husband or your boyfriend. But Jesus said that you have committed adultery with a sinner, that you have presented yourself to him. No, Jesus said that. Who's guilty if you presented yourself like that? Now you see, Brother Branham, you're picking on the women. All right, you men. And anyone that will let you guys smoke cigarettes and wear this kind of clothes, it shows what you're made of. You're supposed to be the ruler of your house. What happened? You can't make American homes. No wonder you've got Greenland delinquency. You've got French delinquency. You've got Dutch delinquency. Certainly we have. That's true. Not to hurt you, but to tell you the truth. We've got to clean up. Got to have a revival and get all the bugs out of the thing before we. God will ever come in. Stand at the door, you say. You interfere with my private life. There it is, see? Well then, you have a little, another little dog called Pride. Oh my, don't you temper with that. Now look at the Branham. I think it's so much today, all right? It's your private life, you say. You've got no business busting in my private life. That's what you're telling Christ. I'm talking from the word. The word speaks for itself. That's right. Private life, just me and the Joneses, you know? See, me and my denomination. You've got no right to draw generational lines in brotherhood, that's right. Not too much difference in doctrines and so forth, which is all right. I eat cherry pie and somebody else eats apple pie, but we are eating the same pie just the same. We've got no right to draw lines just because a fellow don't believe with you. You are the denomination with you, so I pass. I tell you, I don't go to them holy golems. If you ever go to heaven, you're going to go with them, or plenty of them there. Well, I'm Presbyterian, and I don't go well all the way to them. There they are. See, you let him in. You let him save your soul from hell, but you won't let him be your Lord. Lord means a rulership. Lord means ownership. When he comes in, let him in, be your Lord. This great evangelist, Billy Graham, I was at breakfast in Louisville. At his great meeting there, when I heard the man get up and he took the, the Bible and he said, this is the example which is correct, exactly. He said, when Paul went into a city and he had a revival, he said, he came back about a year later and that one fellow, he got saved, had got 30 more saved. He said, I go into a city and have a revival and have 20,000 saved and go back six weeks later and can't find 20. What's the matter? Here's the matter. They just get enthused with the evangelism and um, a big crowd of people. That's all. It's exactly. And the Pentecostals are getting to be the same. What we need is Christ being Lord into his presence here and say, Lord, come in. Now, he said again in there that there's a little dog called Faith. 
wish we had time to open all these doors, but I want to open a look at this little door of his. You know, you say, well, now I've got faith, Brother Branham. I let Jesus come into my heart. You thought you've done him an honor. Sometimes you act like it. Oh, what a great thing you did when you let Jesus come to the door. And stand there. You won't stand very long. But don't worry, I wouldn't stay long. You wouldn't stay long in my house if I said, come, just stand there. Don't you move. Don't you go fooling with anything else here. You'd know he wasn't welcome. That's the difference. That's the reason there's 20 out of 20,000. Now, we need to let him in. And when he comes in, worship him and said, Come in, Lord. Be my Savior. Be my God. Be my ruler. Be my healer. Be my all that I want to know in life. Be. Be my Lord. Take everything that I've got, Lord. And rule it. Take my emotions. I will not get ashamed anymore. Take my pride. Stand in the door and clothe me, Lord, with your word. We went to see a revival. Start then. Stand in my private life. Lord, make me what you'd want me to be. Let not me not take my own thoughts, but take yours. Lord, lead me. O oh Lord, he will never take you from the word. He will keep you right in the word. Not because the Baptists do it, the Pentecost do it, mm-hmm. the Presbyterian, but because God's word says so. You believe it? Man that's never born of the Spirit of God means something that he never gets away from you. There's no man got a right to speak, preach the gospel until path has been on the sacred sands of the backside of the desert. There's theologians in this world that's smart and shrewd and can explain everything away, take everything away, even a whole Bible. They might twist your mind and everything else, but if you'll ever let God come into your heart holy and get that backside of the desert experience, then brother, all devils out of hell can't come on that ground where you, it's something that's real. There's a little door of faith. Oh, you say, preacher, I know you people believe in divine healing, but my faith don't teach it that. Then you've got the wrong faith. See, if you let Jesus come in, you won't say no more. The days of miracles are past. Jesus is in there, and he's a miracle. He's a miracle performer, and he's a miracle that's right there in your heart, just as it was when he walked there. He's there. That's the reason that people won't let him in. Let's stand in that door one time. Use God's faith. It's yours if you've been born again and let Christ come in the door and he'll stand right, right in the door and say, I'm sure, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's right. Every word that I said is part of him. I'm not... Uh, I'm just sitting here, I'm your king, I'm your healer, I'm your joy, the fountains of life, I'm your alpha and omega, I'm your getting up at morning, I'm your going to bed at night, as they would say, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, if I make my head, my bed in hell, he would be there, what, we need an old person revival, how to, notice now, just another thing he said in here, to this Laodicean age, church age, that we are now living in. He said, I cancel you to come and buy oil from me. Fine gold seed. You've said that you are rich. Now, how rich is the church today? The greatest buildings it ever had, the most money it ever had. You say I'm rich and I have need of nothing and you don't know that you are naked, miserable, blind, poor and wretched and don't know it. What is it? I don't know it. Now, if you see a man coming down the street that was wretched, blind, naked, blind, and you will run up to him and say, Sir, you're naked. Oh, am I, sir? Well said. I'll help me. I've got help for you here, and come in right quick. Let me clothe you. Well, if he was, if he would listen to you, all right, but what if the man's in that condition and doesn't know it? And the Bible said that this last church age would be that way. And the Pentecostal people, you've got the best churches you ever had, and you'll be better, a lot better off, down on the mission, with the street down here, in a little ten cent pan, beating on the drums or something like that, calling sinners to repent, than it would have been in these great big churches you got, turning into morgues, you know that, right? Now, that I don't mean to hurt your feelings, I'm your brother, I'm just telling you the truth. So, the Christian church, 
That's the reason I said about you women making all yourself up, you can talk about for women wearing that manicure of your face. You know, well, that stuff, whatever it is, you don't need that. No, sir, that's of the devil. Let me tell you, there's only one woman in the Bible that ever painted her face, and her name was Je- Jezebel. And God fed her to the dogs. So you see, it's dog meat to paint your face like that. I don't mean that for no joke. This is not a place to joke, friend. I'm just telling you the truth. It's a heathen trait. What happened? Now, it says that miserable, wretched, blind, and don't know it. I um, was raised in Kentucky in my little old clapboard thing by house. And Mama used to take all of us little Branham and stick all of us in one bed. About three at the foot and three at the head and about three or four across the middle. And she would... Then we had just one piece of canvas she would put over the top of the bed to keep the snow and the rain out of our eyes and the drops would come through. And at night time, when that cold wind would come through, sometimes Mama called it matcha. Cold would get in our eyes and she'd stick our eyes together. And I was the oldest and she'd say, Billy, come on down. I'd say, Mommy, I can't see. My eyes have stuck together. And my little brother Edward, he'd say, I can't see either mommy. You see, we'd caught cold in our eyes and they got infection and it stuck our eyelids together and my grandpa was a cone hunter and used to catch cones and raccoons and take them out and he would tender the grease out of them and mama would go, get that old pan, set it in the stove, that cone grease, get it real good and hot and come up here and massage our eyes and then if after a while they would happen, it, I don't know what happened, but it softened up the matter in our eyes and we could see. I tell you, brother, there's been a cold spell in the church and the Pentecostal church has caught a bad cold somewhere and it'll take more than a cone grease to open their eyes to the, I'll give you some ice salve and that ice salve will open your eyes and if the preaching of the word don't do it, I don't know any other ice salve. The Holy Spirit warms up the word and tonight across the church, when the church loves that word, certainly it opens the eye. Then you can see if a little dropped that come across the church somewhere. I think you got to breaking up and making I'm this and I'm that. I wonder what we are after all. Oh, if you only knew it, friend, the sons and daughters of God that God is trying to get you just but your eyes muttered. That's all. God spreading some salve is what we want. In this revival here to get the eyes opened up. Look around. See how good God has been to us. I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open up the door, I will come in and commune in with him. And if the Baptist will hear me, if the Methodist will hear it, if the Pentecost will hear it, if the Nazarene and the Pilgrim of Holiness, I'll come in and I'll put a little grace over your eyes and open up your eyes and let you see where we're at. Oh, you know the Pentecostal church has had a revival. When this little minister long while ago, the little Jewish brother here that introduced me about spearheading a revival, we've had a wonderful revival. I don't know whenever in history there's been a revival like there's been this Pentecostal age. That is right. There's revival fires burning in every nation under heaven tonight. That's right. We are in the end time. It's wonderful. Let's say to you here in Dallas, I have quarters of these great churches, these great people. Now, don't feel bad because I say these things. Like I've been saying, I'm saying it for your good and for the good of the gospel, friend. Now, look, then we can have real healing services. Then we can have something real take place. Where we break down our little walls and straighten ourselves up and wash our faces and shake ourselves. Come to that's right. When God will go to blessing us, then the songs of Zion will return the old fashioned blessings that you have longed for. God's God, the Pentecostal skies are full of it. Why would we accept a substitute when the real things are at hand? No need but you what? That we have seen so much until you've lost the value of what you've got. One time there was a man going down to the sea. He wanted a little rest. He had never saw the sea. He'd been raised in more like a desert country and he was on his road to the sea 
and he said, I'm going down. I just long to smell the salt air and to see the great briny waves as they leap into the air and break and the heavens blow, shining down the briny water makes them bloom. Hear the wild scream of the seagulls as they circle over the scene. I long to hear it and to see it. I'll be so restful for me, for I have heard that such things exist. So he made ready to go to the seashore, and just before he got to the seashore, he met an old salt returning, which was an old sailor. And he said, Where goest thou, my good man? He said, I go to the seashore, sir. He said, I go to the to see the great waves, and explain to him how his heart would be thrilled to see, to only see those things. And the salt said, Now, I was born at on that sea, he said, I was born in a ship, he said, and I've watched those waves for 40 years and I've heard those holy girls holler. I don't see nothing exciting about it. You see, he'd saw it so much till it come common. That's the way with divine healing. Someone told me, well, a little preacher prayed for a little girl here yesterday and the two or three inches rolled onto her leg. Mercy, that ought to have set this place on fire. It ought to. The king is here, the great mighty Christ of God who rules the heavens and earth is present and can do great and mighty things if you believe him. Just believe him. Don't you believe it? Certainly, you will just believe him, have faith and say, God, if you'll just open our eyes tonight, let us see your glory. Father God, then we'll do, we'll see great things. And how can you do it unless your eyes come open? Isn't that right? We have to have it. And we see so many great miracles take place that we see people shout and praise the Lord. And yet, we just fail to look at it. Isn't that true? True. Great and mighty moving to become common to us. Just so common that we don't pay any more attention. Some time ago, down in Louisiana, I believe it was in Georgia, an old fellow preacher that I knew, he was a great old man, great soul, but he had an old man that went to, his wife went to church, and she was a godly, saintly old woman. She said that she's prayed for her husband a long time, that his name was Gabriel, and they called him Gabe in sh for short. So they just couldn't get old Gabe taken out. Somehow or another, he couldn't get him taken out with the church and with God. And so this old colored preacher taken old Gabe hunting with him many times, and they'd go out and hunt. So one day they'd been hunting, and all along the road back, both of them had rabbits and birds with hanging over them, till he couldn't even walk hardly, just swallowed it down. They was coming along a certain old familiar path, and as they walked along the, this path, the person kept looking backwards the west as the sun was setting. And brother, I'm telling you, the church ought to know that it's sun setting time. The sun's going down. What's these blessings that we see? What's the prophet say? It will be light in the evening time. What kind of light? How does the sun travel? It rapidly rises in the east and sets in the west. When civilization rose in the east and traveled westward, the east and the west has met together. I'll preach on that this week, the Lord willing. Now notice, in the same light, when the sun comes up and shines in the east, the same sun shines in the west. You get it? The Bible said that the prophet said there'd be a day that wouldn't be day or night, a dismal time, just a dismal time. We've had enough light to join church and build an organization of kind churches. We've had that for 2,000 years, but God promised in the evening time it would be light. What was it? The same light that fell on the Orient, the same Holy Ghost that fell at Pentecost, bringing the same results. It's falling on Western people today, bringing the same results that it brought back there. It will be light, and as he was looking towards the West, the old ducky went walking along there. He touched the person on the shoulder. The preacher looked around, and he seen that old Gabe, and the tears was running down his cheeks, and he said, Person, today is Saturday, and tomorrow morning you're going to find me at the monarch bench, and I'm going to get me a seat by the side of my dear wife back there in that church. There, I'll remain faithful till God takes me life. And the person was so happy to hear that. He said, Gabe, you know that I appreciate you, that I love you, say that it is, but what caused the sudden change? Was it the sermon I preached? Was it the things I talked to you about the goodness mm -hmm. of the Lord? He said, No, person. Coming right around that bend down yonder, I felt something knock at my heart. He said, you know, person, I couldn't hit a barn, he said, I'm the poorest shot in the country. And yet, just look at how many on me, the rabbits and birds that I got myself. He said, I must love me all, 
told them to give them to me. A little a simple thing like that and a knock of Christ on the heart. Gib, I was on my your own car text today. What about you tonight? What about you that drove up in nice cars? What about you that go uh, to the fine churches? What about you that sitting here in good health and not like that little child laying there twisted around on his cot? What about you young lady that sitting here in good health? Maybe this little sick girl in the building there that's party crystal looking child girl. Don't you know that God is knocking on your heart to say it's good to see you? If his goodness, you eat your Sunday dinner yesterday. I stood a few months ago in Bombay, India, where I was preaching to nearly a half a million souls and see them little mothers and them little babies. The little bellies swelled out, dying with hunger. The garbage that you raked on out on the can would feed them. Don't you know that God's knocking at your heart? And here you say, well, I belong to church with a van and prejudice and indifference with the doors closed. Oh, is this entire group of, of about a thousand people here tonight count so many? If you would open every door in your heart to say, Jesus Christ, tonight there will be a great revival breakthrough this next few nights that you get the newspaper headlines. Christ would come. He wants that God, that's God's desire tonight above everything, to have his church one, knocking at your door, fine ministers, fine clothes, fine cars, fine jobs, no wonderful Christ coming at the door. Why don't you let him in? Let him come in. Let us bow our heads just for a moment. Let every eye be closed, if you will. I just wonder, just before we have prayer, if there is some in here, would raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, I ain't got, I'm raising my hand to you. I ain't raising my hand to you. I'm raising it to God because I felt that somewhere along the last few days, I've had a little knocking on my door. I haven't lived the life that I should, Brother Branham. I've been prejudiced. I'm a church member. And I should have done better. I know I should. And I've passed up my neighbors. I've argued with different churches about their doctrine. I've sold it. I've not lived the way I should. I know I shouldn't have done the things that I've done. But by God's grace, I'm going to let the door open tonight. I'm going to let him be my Lord from this hour on. And I'm going to mean this, Brother Branham. I'm not raising my hand to you. I'm raising my hand to Christ. I will come, Lord. And let me remember you in prayer. Quietly now, while everybody's in prayer, will you just raise your hand all over the building? That's it. Set quiet.